Yeah. Welcome to I'm Not Joking, the podcast where a behavioral scientist examines what it's like to live a humorous life. Glimpse into the lives of the funniest people in entertainment, business, and science as your host, Dr. Peter McGraw, explores their habits, motivations, and secrets to success. Get ready to fire up your brain and your funny bone. Now, here's your host. Welcome to I'm Not Joking, the podcast that looks at the lives of funny people. I'm Peter McGraw. Today's guest is Steve Stolier. Steve is the author of Raised Eyebrows, My Years Inside Groucho's House, a bittersweet memoir of the last years in the life of Groucho Marx. He has also written material for Dick Cavett, as well as penning episodes for such television series as Murder, She Wrote, Simon and Simon, the new WKRP in Cincinnati, and Sliders. Welcome, Steve. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Uh, well, I thank you for your patience setting this up. I rescheduled on you like three times, and you kept a sense of humor throughout it. That's what you think. <laughs> You're actually sitting on an ejector seat. <laughs> Lovely. Well, wait 45 minutes before you hit the... All right. So, Steve, if um, if you didn't work or weren't working as a writer, what would you be doing? I Well, I, I've always had an interest in uh, archaeology and paleontology, and I was a history uh, major at UCLA for the first two years I was there. I don't think I gave a lot of thought to exactly what I would do, probably teach, but uh, I'm lucky I fell into the entertainment and literary world because I honestly don't know what else I would do, nor what else I'd be skilled at. All right. So you were meant to be a writer? Uh, by default. Okay. Well, that, you, well, I like to think that writers have transferable skill sets, no? I guess. I j it's never, it was never a compulsion. I never thought, and, you know, as a kid, boy, I'd sure love to write and get up every day and have to write and all that. I, I don't think of writing that way. It's not something that... I absolutely have to do. I have all these stories to tell. Mm. I, have, I have a lot of emails to send and a lot of <laughs> angry comments on Facebook. But I, I honestly, I'm not one of those writers that simply, you know, I'm not disciplined that way. Although somehow I have managed to, you know, stagger from project to project and keep my nostrils above the waterline on rent and other frivolities like that. I see. So that's interesting because I, this has come up a number of times in recent podcast episodes, this notion that writers write. They get up every day, they write. And you're saying you're you're a writer, and you've obviously been a successful writer, but that's not your MO. Right. How, how is it that then you, how do you pull it off then? I don't know, but somehow I've managed to do it. And I mean, I also have done voiceover work and I've edited other people's work uh, but there always seems to be something either you know literary or entertainment angled about it I'm not fabulously wealthy so I don't think it can be said that I've succeeded and now live very comfortably and don't have to worry about you know well so as a I mean I'll put a as a point of contrast I actually just received an email from um, from a friend who's a writer who is thinking of moving to an even cheaper place than he already lives. So thinking about moving to like Montana or Ohio just because it's become so difficult to make to make his way as a writer. And he's and he's a good writer too. It's a very difficult path to navigate in between kidding yourself and throwing in the towel mm. and there is no right way to do it there's no magic litmus test it's very difficult for when people ask my advice my advice usually starts out with don't take anyone's advice mm -hmm. because their circumstances are unique and you can't really transfer that over to well i met this writer and he said the thing to do is this so I don't know. I mean, if he has to keep moving to more obscure, cheaper places and still trying to make it as a writer, and it just becomes this point of diminishing returns, this this occupational decrescendo, he may have to look at whether or not that's wise, if only from a survival standpoint. But I'm very hesitant to want to 
take someone's dream and say, you're kidding yourself or give yourself uh, six months. And if nothing happens by then, because you never know when something might break. But uh, I salute his stick to itness. Indeed. Yeah, I think, you know, some of this is looking for the right break to take things to the next level. Actually, that's um, that's part of the reason that idea right there is part of what brings me to speak to you. So I'm going to foreshadow that and we're going to okay. return to it. Our smarter students will recognize the foreshadowing <laughs> in Peter's early remarks that come into play at 37 minutes and 12 seconds. <laughs> yes. So... Uh, so you you authored Raised Eyebrows, My Years Inside Groucho's House. So you were, um, correct me if I'm wrong, in Groucho's, Groucho Marx's assistant. I'll correct you. And you know why okay. I'll correct you? Because I was a secretary. Okay. And there was nothing derogatory or second class about that. And and I know that people are called assistants now the same way that wait, – that, uh, stewardesses have become flight attendants flight attendants yes. and all that stuff and since i hate loathe and despise political correctness i will stick up for secretary when someone says assistant i picture it as someone you know in a lab coat handing groucho a beaker of uh phenylphthalein solution or something like that and i you know offhand although it was years ago I don't think there were that many times when Groucho said, would you hand me a beaker of phenylphthalein solution, Steve? So I was, in fact, his secretary. I handled the fan mail. I took dictation. I organized his memorabilia for donation to the Smithsonian. And uh, I helped out in those secretarial jobs. I so see. that's the short answer to your question. Well, we have time, so I want to get into the longer answer, if you, if, if I may. Sure. Um, so how how old were you, and how old was Groucho? I was all of nineteen, and Groucho was eighty three, almost eighty four. Okay. When I got the job. All right. And you had it for how long? I had it for the last three years of his life. From July of 1974 to August of 77. So uh, you had mentioned being in college. Did you forego college for that time or you did it while you were a college student? I did it while I was a college student. As a matter of fact, the way I came into Groucho's world was I, I and all of my friends, it was a prerequisite for being a friend of mine that they be Marx Brothers fanatics. I see. And uh, even though the Marx Brothers only made 13 films, one of them, Animal Crackers, uh, had fallen into obscurity over the years, uh, basically because of an oversight where the copyright wasn't renewed by Paramount. And so the rights reverted back to the people who wrote and composed the book and music for the play Animal Crackers, uh, George S. Kaufman, Maury Riskin, Bert Kalmer, and Harry Ruby. And uh, I started a petition drive on Bruin Walk at UCLA while I was a student there to put pressure on Universal Studios, which had acquired Paramount's pre-1949 library, but didn't feel it was worth spending any money to clear the rights to an old black and white movie. And uh, so it was while I was at UCLA that I was also the, the head of the Committee for the Re-Release of Animal Crackers, or Crack, before it had any narcotic significance. And uh, that is what led directly to my employment. I see. So, so Groucho heard about you, found out about you. Groucho's... There was a woman named Erin Fleming who was a struggling Canadian actress and uh, she was looking for any kind of work and there was a producer writer named Jerry Davis uh, who used to be at MGM and then worked on uh, That Girl and The Odd Couple and a lot of other classy shows and uh, he had recommended to her that she ask Groucho for a job because he was looking for a temporary secretary. And uh, Jerry thought, well, this will help them both out. What happened, though, was that 
as more time went by, Aaron became much more in control of Groucho's life personally and professionally, becoming his manager. And really, as, because he was in his 80s and eventually would suffer strokes and was slowing down, he became more reliant on her for making many, many decisions, big and small, in his life. So she was the one who uh, had heard about the committee and arranged to bring Groucho to Bruin Walk one day. And I said, Groucho, I'm very happy to be meeting you after all this time. And he said, well, you should be. And then Aaron said, this is Steve Stoliar. He's the one who started the committee to get Animal Crackers re-released. And Groucho said, did you get it? And I said, not yet, but we're working on it. And he said, you better or I'll fire you. And I said, I didn't realize I was working for you. How much are you paying me? And he said, a little less than nothing. <laughs> so that was a, a remarkable path crossing. Because really, all I had ever wanted to do was shake his hand and thank him for all the laughs. And I thought, that will never that will never happen. He's in his 80s and fading out. I had seen his one-man show in December of 72 at the Dorothy Chandler Pavilion from way in the back of the auditorium, and I thought, that is as close as I'm ever going to get to this man. And yet here we were shaking hands and chatting with each other in front of reporters and news people and a throng of hippies and Marx fans and students uh, who kept crushing, kept pushing in to try to hear because his voice was so kind of thin and papery by then, and they didn't want to miss anything. And we were concerned for his safety because really there were hundreds of people there. But the film was released, and two, I had two summer jobs that fell through, for which I will forever remain grateful. And my dad was pushing me, get off your fanny, I don't want you lying around the house, find a job, you know. Mm -hmm. And I thought I had nothing to lose, so I called Aaron and I said, is there anything at all that you think I might maybe? And she said, well, actually, I used to be Groucho's secretary, but I'm so busy with other business matters. We need someone to handle his fan mail, which has just gotten voluminous in recent years, and also to organize all of his memorabilia, which is going to be donated to the Smithsonian. But it has to be someone who really knows a lot about the Marx Brothers. And in my mind's eye, like a Tex Avery cartoon, she's still on the phone while I'm on the doorstep (laughs) ringing, (laughs) ringing the bell. I know there was a gap of time there. And, of course, I wouldn't have known where to go. I also, I thought that I would be working in an office, you know, maybe on, in an office building on Wilshire Boulevard handling forwarded fan mail. Sure. And maybe I'd get to see him twice a month if he came in to pick stuff up or sign. She says, oh, no, dear, you'll be working directly in Groucho's house. There's a room that his last wife used as an artist studio that you could use uh, for your office, and you can make your own hours. Hmm. And I thought, and they're going to pay me money to do this? <laughs> and it really was just like my mom used to talk about wanting to just bathe in chocolate sauce, just this indulgent, you can't get enough of it. And in fact, I was like ankle deep in just the most amazing, you know, old Groucho letters and scrapbooks with reviews of their vaudeville and Broadway shows and photos of the brothers out of makeup and scripts with Groucho's handwritten notations, all this stuff. And there was a lot of fan mail coming in because this was right when the Marx Brothers hit that resurgence in the late 60s and 70s when the uh, iconoclastic baby boomers embraced the anarchy of the Marx Brothers and W.C. Fields and Mae West. And also they had begun re-syndicating Groucho's TV show, You Bet Your Life. So that was reaching a whole new audience as well. So he really, when I came to work for him, was riding a crest of rediscovery, even though he never officially was retired or forgotten. 
you know, he didn't have the same sort of problems that, for instance, Stan Laurel or Buster Keaton did, just taking, you know, any job to keep money coming in and only, you know, a handful of devoted people really keeping in touch with him and, and saluting him. Groucho, you know, he did in the, in the mid sixties, late sixties, he was doing guest appearances. He would be on the Dick Cavett show, he even did the Hollywood squares, but he was never really retired. Mm -hmm. And then came this wave of recognition. Uh, and I was delighted to be part of that. Part of that was animal crackers playing in theaters in 35 millimeter for the first time in decades. And, uh, I think it, yeah, it, it broke the house record at the UA Westwood that had been set by the French connection. So that was personally gratifying because I knew there would be people that wanted to see this more than just my friends. Mm -hmm. You know, um, so within a week, I'm speaking to someone who is a huge Groucho Marx fan. So previously I talked to Mike Reese, who's a writer for The Simpsons. Oh, yeah, yeah. And Mike. R-E-I-S, right? R E I double S. Yes, yeah. But and not, he, yeah. yes, and he, um, he adores the Marx Brothers and talked about having watched Duck Soup more than 50 times in mm -hmm. his life. And he had, he had an interesting line, if I remember correctly. He, he, he argued that, um, that Groucho is the best verbal humorist ever and, um, was, was paired with Harpo, the best nonverbal humorist ever. Or among the best. I can't, I can't. Hey, what about Zeppo? <laughs> and then he said Zeppo just helped hold, hold things together. <laughs> I guess. Yeah. And Chico, of course. Well, it, I wouldn't wrestle him to the ground saying that's, that's preposterous. Groucho, you know, in addition to being verbally skilled, Groucho's facial expressions, plus he was quite lithe and, uh, you know, if you watch him dancing, hooray for Captain Spaulding and the way he walked and the wiggling he eyebrows physical... and all that, there was a physicality to him that was more than just the lines. Um, I'm sure, you know, Chaplin and Keaton fans might Indeed. argue with yeah. the Harpo thing, but given the fact that they were brothers, that is a pretty rare, completely capricious happenstance. And my guess is that probably each of them made the other one better. As a result of that contrast. I think so. And I think even, even, you know, as much guff as Zeppo gets for not adding a lot, when he was subtracted and then you tended to see like Kenny Baker or, uh, John Carroll or, you know, some of the bland leading men there, you, you, you wished that Zeppo were still among them because there was a certain kindred spirit. I mean, they had been through so much together from vaudeville mm -hmm. and Broadway. And, and there is the, the cliche, which was true from my own experience, that Zeppo had a great charisma and was very, very funny off camera. Mm, I've heard that. I've read that. It's true. Yeah. I mean, I witnessed it. Mm -hmm. I was the brunt of it to some degree. He teased and, you? Yeah. I was going with a young lady at the time, and Zeppo was coming up from Palm Springs, and Aaron asked if I wanted to st stay to dinner and meet him. And I said, I would, but I have a date. And Aaron said, bring her. Mm. And I thought, oh, I like that. Because this is the uh, young lady I was dating was very self-possessed and unflappable. And I thought, this will flap her. <laughs> so I picked her up and she said, where are we going? And as I start to snake my way up Hillcrest Road in Beverly Hills, she I said, a little out of the way place. And she said, oh, I know where we're going. I don't want to do this. And then I thought, too bad. I'm putting you through this. And it ended up being a delightful evening. And Zeppo, big surprise, took a, took a liking to her. Okay. She was 19, very bright, blonde hair, blue eyes. He was flirtatious. Uh, he said, you know, Steve, you uh, you and Linda should visit me in Palm Springs sometime. And I said, I don't know. I was there when I was about eight, and it was just sweltering. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, when were you there in the summer? 
And I said, yeah. And he said, well, Steve, you know, it's cold in Alaska during the winter, too. And she and I eventually broke up, and I, I wrote him a letter figuring he'd been around the block a few times with relationships, asking for advice for the lovelorn. I get a phone call from Palm's Steve at Zeppo Marx. Uh, uh, I got your letter. I hope I'm not stepping on your toes, but do you think Linda would go out with me? <laughs> and I thought, this is really weird. Yeah. I asked him for help, and he's hitting on her. And I thought, well, I I mean, she got a kick out of him. And, 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 I mean, she was 19, and he was 74. Okay, yeah. And I said, well, I, all I can say is I'll ask her and he said, really, uh, I would never want to do anything that would upset you. You understand that. And so if this is at all uh, awkward, or, no, 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 that's a bad thing. So I asked her, and she kind of thought it would be a kick. And uh, they went out once. He took her to dinner in San Diego and then a high ally game in Tijuana. Oh, wow. That's which I guess that's for a 50 plus year age difference. Well, I mean, he wasn't playing high alive. Yes. They were merely, I guess that was Zeppo's first date. <laughs> we go to dinner in San Diego, then a high alive. But I saw him after that, and he said, I want to tell you, Steve, I didn't even kiss her goodnight. Yeah, you need to know that. I had a lovely time, but all she did was talk about herself. And then I saw her on campus, and she said, uh, Zeppa was really nice, but all he did was talk Talking about himself. himself. <laughs> yeah, and I think we're probably both right. But after that, when I'd be at a party and Zeppa would be up from Palm Springs, he would introduce me to someone and say, this is Steve. He and I dated the same girl, but he got further with her than I did. Okay, that's funny. So, so I, I want to I wanna step back for a second. I know I was foreshadowing most of that. Uh-oh. So, so Groucho is... Not going to uh, have to backshadow for a while. <laughs> is such an um, iconic figure right so um i brought a copy of the humor code and on the humor on the copy of the book sitting right across from me is um a planet with the well-known groucho eyebrows glasses nose you know mustache you know so this is you know few you know few people in comedy have that iconic signature you know this is equal to the michael jordan um, right, you know, leg spread, dunking right. the Michael ball. Michael Jack, from Nike. Michael Jackson sequined white glove. Exactly, yeah. right? You know, so <clears> this <throat> is. I mean, but however, right? So even though that's familiar, yes, there are likely to be listeners who only vaguely know about Groucho and the Marx Brothers. And so, if you, if I could, if you would indulge me with a brief, like history lesson, you know, kind of rise of this of this comedy. Um, true. Okay. Remind me that that's your question. Okay. In case I forget, but I first wanted to say that as I get older, and I am apparently getting older, it's interesting. In one sense, there are fewer people who can place the name Groucho and the Marx Brothers because you get past Generation X and then into the Millennials, and there's just so much content for them to see, to stay up, you know, to podcasts and everything else. Also, that, if I, that if I it, may, yeah. you know, the some, like, comedy generally doesn't travel as well right. as, as drama does. So, you know, people still read Shakespeare. And right. Casablanca holds up pretty well as a movie. Right. You know, the uh, even elite comedy, you know, st often can struggle. Right. And... Well, but the flip side of the few, you know, people that I have to explain who they were is that I will often hear from people saying, I ran monkey business and my granddaughter who's four laughed at Harpo mm -hmm. or my son who's 10 thought Groucho was very funny or I showed it in my class and it went over well. And that, you know, when I was working at Groucho's, I would meet all of his contemporaries the people who wrote and directed his films, fellow humorists and writers. And to them, I was this young whippersnapper, mm -hmm. this kid. And it was gratifying to them that someone at that late date knew all about who Nat Perrin or Irving Brecker or S.J. Perelman or Maury Riskind were. 
now that I'm in my 60s, I find myself, you know, having the cockles of my heart warmed by hearing that some of these kids today still appreciate the Marx Brothers. But unfortunately, a negative force working against it is the horrid plague of political correctness so, that is really, you know, I'll have people say, the way Groucho treated those women on You Bet Your Life is so sexist. He really, it's like they feel like he should have been ashamed of himself in retrospect because 60 years later, it would fall out of fashion to be flirtatious or for the, for an older man to be flirtatious with a younger woman after the whole Me Too thing. And that somehow it's a retroactive political correctness that gets me more head up than regular political correctness because that's the kind of thing. I mean, there was that Lillian Gish uh, auditorium at that college and they they renamed it because she was in Birth of a Nation which glorifies the Klan, and that's just not something they want to be associated with. And there's just such a low tolerance for things. And, and of course, as you were talking about the timeliness of comedies versus timelessness of classics, there's lines in Marx Brothers films that, you know, cause people to gasp. You know, Groucho says the Headstrongs married the Armstrongs, and that's why darkies were born. Well, there was a song called That's Why Darkies Were Born that was very popular. It doesn't mean that Groucho was a racist or thought that black people were second-class citizens. As a matter of fact, he was, for a man born in 1890, remarkably progressive and liberal, given the fact that he was literally a Victorian. Mm. And, um, you know, there's lots of pictures of him with his arm around Nat King Cole and extolling the virtues of Sammy Davis and civil rights and all this stuff. I see. But now there's such a zero tolerance that you get that or some of the musical numbers with Harpo from Day at the Races and, and at the Circus where all these happy dancing black people are behind him like following, uh, the Pied Piper or something like that. And, and uh, there's no sense of historical perspective. There's only reflexive condemnation. I see. So th this actually anticipates a question that I was going to ask. It foreshadows it. I um I wanted to. I was going to ask you how do you think Groucho? And I knew I'd forget what your question was. We'll get, but we'll get to back. To yeah. That. The answer to that question will be even sweeter having all right. set up all this. How do you think Groucho would react to in today's kind of outrage culture, like? I don't, I think he would find it ridiculous because Groucho was a reasonable, fair minded person who could see both sides of almost any argument. I think he was a very fair evaluator of people, people who he disagreed with, he still respected. I mean, there's a wonderful firing line with Groucho and William F. Buckley, who were diametrically opposed politically, but he admired Buckley. Mm -hmm. And, uh, they have a very intelligent, not going for the laughs conversation. It's available. It might be on YouTube, but it's available, uh, you know, uh, on I, DVD. If I find it, I'll put it on the, in okay. the exhibits. Yeah. And it's interesting because it's a, it's a, it's a sort of agreeing to disagree conversation between two very intelligent people who respect each other. Maury Riskind, who co-wrote Coconuts, Animal Crackers, Night at the Opera, Adapted Room Service, and was uh, you know, a close, close friend of Groucho in the early years and for the rest of his life took a real sharp right turn and became a, a just a super, super conservative Republican writing for the Herald Examiner and just decrying everything about uh, the people who were protesting the Vietnam War and all this. I mean, he was really, you know, like a, a Goldwater Republican. And Groucho it didn't cut off from him. He didn't say he's not welcome here anymore. They just would either steer clear of politics or just have sort of a pleasant disagreement and then go on to something else. Mm. But Groucho was big enough to say, I like this man a lot. We're longtime friends. That's not a deal breaker that he's super red Republican and I'm a super blue Democrat. Mm. And I, and I, you know, Groucho also didn't have much tolerance for 
the intellectualism. I mean, for instance, I, I sort of bristle on his behalf since he is a, isn't around anymore. When people talk about duck soup as a satire on the futility of war, they may see it as that, but anyone who tries to give credit to any of the writers, the director, or any of the four Marx brothers for setting out to make a satire on the futility of war is flat out wrong. It's not a matter of opinion. And they were interviewed over the years, and to a man, they said, we were not making statements on war. It had nothing to do with, you know, Hitler being elected that year and war, you know, trying to have a message or something. We were just trying to be funny. Mm -hmm. And if you think, well, in Coconuts, Groucho was the manager of a hotel, and in Horse Feathers, he's the head of a college. What would be the next logical? Well, how about making him the head of a mythical country? Mm -hmm. That would give him even more raw material. And the year before, Paramount had done Million Dollar Legs with W.C. Fields, where he was the president of Klopstakia, another one of those you know mythical European places. So people see things in the films that were not intended, and it's just, it's a, it's an actual mistake to try to credit them with intentionally satirizing the futility of war and sending a message. They were just trying to find what is a, what setting would lend itself to funny stuff with the Marx Brothers, and making him the head of a country would be the ultimate example of that. So he he wouldn't get angry about it, but he would just kind of you know, cluck his tongue and shake his head and say, we were just trying to be funny. I see. And that's what the writer said. And that's what Leo McCary said when, when Joe Adamson interviewed him for Groucho, Harpo, Chico, and sometimes Zeppo, wonderful book. It is a mistake to ascribe these. You, you'll read about King Kong and they'll say that the, the sliding of the big log through the gate is it's sexual it's a it's meant to represent kong's virility and all this and it's like no it kept kong on the other side of the wall uh -huh. you see <laughs> um or can you can i give you another anecdote that isn't marx related sure. or it's another good example of if i understand what you're <clears throat> saying is while in literature and film and music and so on some people do have they want to satirize. They want to have these, you know, illusions. They want to reference other things. But sometimes a cigar is just a cigar. Yep, exactly. Yes. Okay. John Ford had appeared at UCLA a year or two before I was there. They had a, a screening of the searchers for students and then a Q&A afterwards. And I wasn't there then, but my teacher told me that Ford was sitting in a chair and they were taking questions from the students, and one kid raised his hand and said, Mr. Ford, I notice in a lot of your films, you use a lot of fences. And I was wondering if the fences were meant to represent how man borders himself, separates himself from his fellow man or from nature. What is it that, that the fences are meant to signify and why you use them in your films? And Ford leaned into the microphone and said, son, I make a lot of westerns, and out west there's a lot of ranches, and if you don't have fences, the cows walk away. <laughs> right. Yeah, you know, I I think that this is an interesting, I mean, certainly, you know, critics and academics and so on are very good at reading deeply into things, even when they don't need to. Right. Um, I actually just... Um, Actually, it was given to me um, a, a clip. It was a filmmaker who who basically dissected a scene out of uh, the movie that he made, Shazam, and just explained how so much of filmmaking is just problem solving. And um, you know, he's, you mean and and just impromptu, like it was raining that day, so we shot it indoors. It or, could be that, or yeah. you know, in in his case, and I'll, I'll put this in the exhibits. In his case, he he basically explained, well, like there's sort of a peculiar set of behaviors that the characters engaged in, which is they put their jackets on, they came out onto the porch, then they were told to go back inside, you know, kind of this kind of thing. And mm -hmm. it's like it would have just made more sense to just put them in the window. 
you know, and have them in the window during the scene. And he's like, well, the reason that this happened is the wardrobe person said, listen, the kids are now going to be in these subsequent set of scenes in winter and they're going to be in their jackets. Mm -hmm. And so if you can have them in their jackets now, it just creates continuity later. Right. And he's like, shit. Okay. How do we do this? And so you make a, you know, in this case, he makes a sort of what, what seems like a peculiar set of dis- directorial decisions because mm-hmm. he's just trying to solve this problem. How do I get these kids in the coat, in their coats? You know, and how is it that they don't take them off when they go back into the, right, into the place? And, you know, he's relying on a little bit of change blindness in, in the audience. If they're focusing on these. continuity errors, they're not caught, caught up in the plot and the characters. In, indeed. And most people get caught up in the plot and the characters are transported by narrative. So, so I, you know, yeah, this idea is like, you know, you, you, these people are on a ranch and so there's going to be fences. And this is how we know they're on a ranch versus out in the middle of, you know, the middle right. of the American West. I think that's great. So, you know, this idea of trying to, so dealing with kind of outrage culture, political correctness, the fact that it's easier now than ever for people to have opinions and express them broadly, you right. know, via Facebook, Twitter, Instagram and beyond, I think is interesting for comedy. You know, there's a lot of comics, especially middle aged comics who complain about it. You know, I don't, I don't do colleges anymore right. and so on. You know, I have to yeah, say. What would happen if Don Rickles were starting now? He wouldn't get booked. So, so this is, I think this is an interesting thing. First of all, the comics who say, I don't do, I'm not doing colleges anymore for the most part are comics who've made their money. So they don't need to do co- colleges right. anymore. Seinfeld. Indeed. Yeah. Seinfeld Chris would probably Rock be okay. And so on. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Because Seinfeld made $69 million last year. Right? Carefully budgeted, you can get by on that. Yes, indeed. So here's my belief is that the best comics adapt. They they change based upon the the culture. You know what I mean? That is, they're good at seeking out the right audience for them. And so, first of all, I think that Don Rickles would be fine. And the reason why I think Don Rickles would be fine is because Anthony Jeselnik is fine. That is, that you can, you can be a comic like Anthony Jeselnik and not hold back at all. Right. Ricky Gervais. And you can find an audience right. who, who welcomes it. The other one is, is that what, what you do is you, so there was a time where comics, people like George Carlin and Richard Pryor, went bluer right they they turned up the volume right. on the they started out and... wearing a suit with short hair and ended up with either a, a, f- the frizzy afro of prior or the long hair and beard of carlin and a lot of four-letter words exactly they adapted well you can adapt in the other direction if you need to i have to think about that because that starts to make me uneasy because well, it it starts to sound like if you're going to entertain at colleges, you better know that if you use this phrase or if you try to go this route, you're going to get hissed or booed because you've trespassed on something that is now taboo and you should think of a different joke or a different way to go unless you don't mind pissing off the audience. And that's that doesn't sound like it goes in reverse the same way it goes forward with blue uh, material i don't i don't know why there's an asymmetry there i mean i guess my thing is this is look you can be an artist or or you can you can do commerce and so if you expect people to pay for your shows mm-hmm. then the audience does have a say and so in that way being recognizing it, it is show business cha- it's, it isn't just sitting in your velvet smock and painting an abstract in the attic that no one is ever going to see or writing poems in a diary and only you have the key to it. You are doing something intended to make money. And if you only alienate people, then what have you accomplished? That's, that's the point. Which right. is, and, and, and I also think the other one is this, is that I think that idea of I'm not going to do college campuses anymore sells the comic short in their ability to tackle tough topics but i see i think it's 
Uh, it makes me want to take the students by the hand, by the shoulders, and shake them and say, listen and and think and understand context and stop being like a knee that gets hit with a rubber hammer and you shut down at the first mention of this thing, you know, especially right. because college is supposed to expose you to think, you know, that it's like the First Amendment, it, it protects uh, safe speech, but it doesn't need it. It needs people to, you know, it's the I would fight to the death for your right to express it. Even I, if I, I think that's fair. I, I, and I'll, I'll make a counterpoint. And, you know, as someone, I, sp I spend time on college campuses. Yeah. And so I, so I see this. The issue is this is that withdrawing and saying, I'm out doesn't help in okay. this, in the idea is that if you, if the comics, so, I mean, let's be honest, comics, their first goal was to get the laughs. Their second goal is to change people's mind. Right. So if you give them a choice between the laughs and the changing your mind, they're going to take the laughs 99% right. right. of the time. So the, so to, to pull yourself out of that, then foregoes both the laughs and the ability to change minds. I agree. And so if you are worried about the youth of the nation, the youth of the world and their fragilities and sensitivities and, and, um, the fact that they're, they're well meaning, but snow plowing parents are actually, setting them up for failure then the question becomes can you use your superior communication to cognitive the gap. comedic abilities to find a gentle way to start to make this happen that, that so that's what i, I don't say. know i mean it's a rhetorical I, question and the issue is this you know what i think that you can and you know who's going to do it not the 50 year old comics not the 60 year old comics it's going to be the 20 and 30 year old comics and 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 that's just the nature of I think art, you mm -hmm. know. And so and so the you know the yeah. Chris Rocks have the luxury of being like I'm out, right. you know. But if you're 25 and you're trying to to get 10 years of comic experience to become great, boy, that's a great. If you and then if you can navigate those crowds, you can navigate any crowd. Yeah. So that's okay. it's a, that's my that's my counterpoint <laughs> as someone who again I have the I have the great. Luxury of not having to make people laugh clearly. And you've I'm certainly I'm succeeded. Doing, I'm very good at that. So let's get let's get back to yes. the primer. I want you to give a primer on the Marx Brothers, their rise, their rise from vaudeville to have you know to creating among some people say Duck Soup is the best comedy film ever made. Yeah. So so let's talk. I about I always that rise. try to avoid those. What are the hundred funniest or yes. best or worst? Because it's all. Yeah, I agree. Anyway. But, but nonetheless, yes, it's, I yes, mean, it's there's highly consensus of, yes. that this is a top comedy film. Right, and their best. Yes. The Marx Brothers were born in New York in the late 1800s. Zeppo, the last, the youngest, was born in 1901, so he just made it to the 20th century. And uh, they began as singers and uh, eventually started throwing comedy material in and this was in vaudeville in the very early 1900s and they would tour the country playing every manner of uh, live theaters that had vaudeville and they would be on the bill with acrobats and trained dogs and and, and so vaudeville being both a place and a type of entertainment right it wasn't it wasn't a Broadway show. It was like a variety show, assuming anyone knows what variety shows still are, where you would have a comedian and then a singer and a tap dancer and an animal act. You would pay your money and get an evening's worth of entertainment. And generally speaking, the star attraction was second to last on the bill. That was considered the most prestigious why, spot. Why penultimate? I don't know. Well, certainly the first couple of acts, people are still taking their seats. Indeed, so you yeah, fritter sure. it away. And maybe it's just like, and and now here's what you've all been waiting for. And then too bad for the person that follows. Yeah, them. it seems, you know, yeah, that's interesting. But that was, I mean, it was generally considered second to last was the ultimate billing in vaudeville. Interesting. So the, by the time they got into comedy, they still weren't doing shows with a beginning middle and end they were doing 
sketches, humorous sketches, like that would take place in a classroom or something like that. And Harpo, named because that was his instrument of choice, would get a solo. And Chico, because he chased chicks, had an Italian accent, obviously not natural since they were Jewish kids from the Upper East Side. He would play the piano. I don't think it was a decision on Harpo's part not to speak. I think he didn't have, he was nervous and he didn't have a very good knack for remembering lines and delivering them convincingly. So his verbal participation gradually decrescendoed to the point where he said nothing but acted with his body and noises like honking a horn or make whistling and was a pantomime artist and a harpist, a quite accomplished harpist, self-taught, self-taught on the wrong shoulder because he was looking at photos that were reversed. How interesting. Yeah. But, the, you know, he played better on the wrong shoulder than most did correctly. So, And then in the early 20s, they started uh, having more sophisticated material that was enough to build an actual Broadway show around. Uh, the first was I'll Say She Is, which still didn't really have much of a plot, but at least was a prestigious Broadway show rather than the knockabout, you know, having to avoid donkeys and magicians backstage. At least it was a Broadway show. And then they really hit their stride with The Coconuts in 1925, which was written by George S. Kaufman, who was just the most successful playwright at the time. I would compare him to Neil Simon, except I wonder how many people know who Neil Simon is now. <laughs> Having Kaufman write the material really elevated their prestige, and The Coconuts was a huge hit, followed by Animal Crackers on Broadway. And then Paramount signed them up to do movies. The first two were shot in New York on Long Island. And in fact, they were shooting the film version of Coconuts during the day and at night would go back into Manhattan to make up for their live performance in Animal Crackers. Mm -hmm. So they were performing two different shows, one for the camera and one for live audiences. Yeah, I want to inter inter interrupt with a couple questions real yeah. quick. So, you know, one thing that's sort of striking about the rise of, of the Marx Brothers is that it, it feels familiar in the same way that you find stand-up comics in particular, maybe improvisers, but mostly you think of stand-ups as, as kind of taking a bigger stage, moving, you know, to sort of more accessible medium so you know S steve martin at one point being the world's biggest stand-up and getting into tv and film and right then branching out right and, and not only in just performing but other roles writing directing producing etc right. kind of thing because you you earn the clout to call the shots yeah instead of being at the mercy of a producer or something like that yeah and the, so the marx brothers seem like one of the first if not the first to really do that to move, you know, to move from vaudeville to to Broadway to, I'd have to, to think of. I mean, the, he, there were contemporaries like Eddie Cantor. Eddie Cantor is another like misconception that the record was set straight in a film class at UCLA. That the biggest, most popular money makers uh, in early sound comedy. Mm -hmm were not the Marx Brothers, Mae West, and W.C. Fields. It was Eddie Cantor, Joe E. Brown, and Will Rogers, who okay. today probably have 17 fans combined. Yeah, yeah. So why the change? Why, you know, because I know I'm actually going to, I'm super interested in Mae West also uh -huh. as a... Got to meet her at Groucho's too. No, that must have been neat. Oh my, yes. Yeah. What a fascinating woman. And 4'11 in her stocking feet. Is that right? Yep. I didn't know that. Yep. No, well, in any case, I think it's <clears> Well, so, but, 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 so tastes change. Yeah. The people who were white hot in 1930, 31, 32, it didn't travel well. If you watch Eddie Cantor musical comedies now, 
they're pleasant. You can see why he would be a popular and likable entertainer, but nobody just can't catch their breath because of Eddie Cantor's rapid fire stuff or the zany antics of Joey Brown. Most people now, if they can place the name Joey Brown, remember him as Osgood, the older millionaire in Some Like It Hot. Oh, yes. That falls for Jack Lemon in drag. Yeah, that's right. Um, but he was super, super popular decades earlier. Interesting. But had, you know, it, it just, there aren't Joey Brown fans. Will Rogers has a place as a, as a revered and beloved humorist because of the witty things that he said that are still true about politics yeah, and Washington sure. and that sort of thing. But watching a feature length Will Rogers film, uh, asks a bit of the audience, I see. uh, which, you know, and it isn't the movie's fault. Nobody in 1930 thought, I wonder if 90 years from now this will still hold up. It's only a fluke and, and a credit to the people whose material still makes people laugh now, even if there are, you know, the occasional trespasses into what's no longer politically acceptable. But still, in general, people will enjoy the Marx Brothers, the Three Stooges, Abbott and Costello. Yeah, sure. I mean, some of it is the physicality yes. of it all. I think, right. You know, that's, to me, physical comedy. Drawing a close. saw across someone's head will always be funny unless it's in real life. Indeed, yeah. So the, um, so the second thing I want to ask about was something that I read. Because they were doing theater and then they were turning these theater shows into movies, but they tested out lots of jokes. They knew what worked, what didn't work, and, and it it helped enhance the funniness of the movies. Well, the unlike fun- like you know, unlike most comedies today, you film these scenes, you think they're funny, right. but you don't know how funny they are until you test screen it. Right, and then if you don't have enough funny scenes, you have to rush, rush and scramble to do reshoots. Um, There's also, I mean, one of the problems with the Marx Brothers, well. All right, let me lay this out. So is it, but is that right that, you know, be, they yes. have that advantage? Yes and no. Okay. Coconuts and Animal Crackers were Broadway smashes that then traveled across the country yes, in the road right. show. So they knew what worked and, and they knew the stuff. Mm-hmm. But when they went to Hollywood in 31 after making the film versions of Coconuts and Animal Crackers, the, the next three films they made, Monkey Business, Horse Feathers, and Duck Soup uh-huh. are, I think, the golden trinity, the the high point, the purest, funniest stuff they ever did. Okay. Unfortunately, audiences in the early 30s missed a lot of the dialogue and the gags because they were laughing so hard. Oh, interesting. The pace is much quicker than in Coconuts and Animal Crackers. And I mean, because also it, part of it was that that the boom microphone opened them up. You know, in early sound films in the late twenties, they had to have the mic somewhere near where the actors were, so uh, uh, they couldn't really move that much, or the the sound wouldn't pick them up. Mm. And then in Hollywood, they had the boom microphone that could follow them around. And and with Monkey Business, it was just like the Marx Brothers had been shot out of a cannon compared to coconuts and animal I crack. See. Then when Duck Soup, it didn't perform that well at the box office, so Paramount didn't pick up their option. And they were toying with going back to Broadway, where they were fully appreciated and big hits, and people didn't bug them about the things that studios would. Um, Irving Thalberg, who was running MGM in the 30s, was playing bridge with Chico, and he said, you know, I could make a movie with you and your brothers that would have half as many laughs and make twice as much money. Oh, that's interesting. And that begat Night at the Opera and the great controversy amongst Marx Brothers fans because I think that the average fan of classic cinema, which is not mean before Star Wars, it means silent comedy, 30s, 40s, maybe into the 50s, uh, they would think that A Night at the Opera 
is the Marx Brothers' best film. Okay. And it may be their best film in terms of production values and pacing and quality. But in terms of laughs, Thalberg was right. It had half as many laughs, and and that and Day at the Races were their biggest money makers. But the purists, and I consider myself one of those, see going to MGM as the beginning of the end for the Marx Brothers as opposed to hitting the big time because MGM was so prestigious. And, and Groucho said it meant the world to them to go to MGM, which was a, a bigger deal than Paramount mm -hmm. because there you were with Clark Gable and Greta Garbo and Gene Harlow, and uh, you'll have to Google all these names. Yeah, and um, this was a time... This is a time where actors had a contract with the studio. The studio, yes. right. And so the other thing that Irving Thalberg did was he said, because so many laughs got laughed over in your Paramount films, let's take some of the scenes on the road and try them mm, out yeah. live. Okay. And they did that with Night at the Opera and Day at the Races, and they had the writers sitting in the audience taking notes. This got a big laugh. This didn't go over well. And then they would, they would revise the dialogue and they were able to leave room for the laughs such that if you pop the DVD of Night at the Opera in and watch it by yourself, it seems slow because there are moments when like Chico and Groucho are looking at each other after saying something. And it isn't because they forgot the next line. It's because they're letting room for the laugh there. For, a, for an you, audience in a right. theater. Not if you see it room. in a theater now with an audience that, you know, appreciates the material, it works. It still works. But the Paramount films don't really require the communal experience. Yes. So it was a it was a give and take when they went to MGM. I see. That's super fascinating. So that's that's somewhat consistent with my understanding about this. So yeah, that's really really neat. So we're um we're almost out of time. Okay. But um I would say uh, I want to I want to chat with about you a little bit more in a moment, but I I is in terms of this sort of primer, you know, so so they do it their seems 13 there's so films. much to say. I yes. Know. Well, they do that people can read your book. They do that. Yeah. Yes. I, w I wouldn't stop them from reading the book. Available in three floor mats. It's available on uh, on Amazon. You can get either the the paperback or Kindle or the audio book with me doing all of the voices, which so I'm used to doing just from telling people. That, you know, George Burns would come over and say, okay, let's eat. You want to live to be an old man, become an actor. I Groucho, how I, I remember when you and Gracie were. Da -da. So I'm used to slipping in and out of the voice. So anyway, I wanted, I wanted to actually ask you about that. That was oh. something that I was, was going to come up. So I'm uh, about to sneeze. So. We actually talked about moments like You'll this. You'll want to leave that up. sneeze. We're leaving in. that in. Yeah. That's the best part. The very <laughs> convincing, by the way. <laughs> so. You you said you you've done voiceover work and yeah. very clearly you do voices. Thank you. Where'd you get that? No idea. Okay. People ask me how can you do how can you you know suddenly sound like Raymond Burr while you're talking? Tokyo is in ruins as Godzilla. And the best I can come up with is how do you know how to shape your lips to whistle a specific note? Mm. I don't know. I, I just see. have had a flair for it since I was a kid. And would get in trouble for making fun of teachers and rabbis and I so see. forth. Okay, uh, yeah, I, I've enjoyed it. Thank you. I've enjoyed it. So, you, so you did the audio book. Now, I hear. So, I'm working on a new book, and I asked about um, reading it, doing it for Audible, and the folks I'm working with very politely but sternly said, "Don't." And they essentially said, "Get a pro. It's incredibly difficult." And of course, pros make it look easy. Right. It's very difficult and it'll be better for your listeners and better for you. It's um, on a case by case basis. Okay. If you, if you have a flair for that and you tell it well and you can enunciate and you don't mind. I mean, it took many hours say, yes. in, in a, like a sweat box. It was really, uh, the circumstances weren't the greatest, although it, it came out very nicely and I'm very pleased with it. Uh, I cannot imagine anyone else doing it. I mean, for you, but, it seems but perfect. But see, if you see, I mean, you must have seen, especially local commercials, 
where you can tell the owner of the store said, no one can put this across the way yes, I can. That's right. And they say, we have every kind of jacket that you could ever look for because you, <laughs> the customer, are important to us. And they think, yeah, that's what I want. And you don't. You want some of the, you know, you, the customer, are important to us. And that's why we want you to. So you, there is no blanket rule about that. See, but yeah. you need to understand you are getting into a, a heavy duty recording. We would have, God, we had to take breaks for oxygen and Diet Coke because it was so hot and he had to turn the air conditioner off because you got the ambient yes, right. in the background. So I, you know, I can't advise you, but as far as someone just saying, no, don't do it, leave it to the professionals, I wouldn't accept that as definitive. That's fair. Um, nor would I say, no, no one could do this the way I can. Cause if, if you end up like the clothing salesman, then it's like, they should have gotten someone that can do this. Yeah, I see. But clearly you have more skills than I have. I don't know. Mm, I think it's fair to say. I don't mind. I don't mind saying when I'm outclassed. Ah, let's, let's talk a little bit about, um, so you've also, besides writing, you've also worked on documentaries. Yes. So, uh, John Lennon, Elvis Presley. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and Shemp Howard. Mm -hmm. so, oh, I got to, I got to interview Shemp's so, so again, granddaughter. I think I think people oh. know John Lennon, Elvis Presley. Martin we don't Luther know King. who Martin Luther King is, but believe me, they know who Shemp is, and that's what's wrong with America, ladies and gentlemen. And so, who, who is Shemp? <laughs> Shemp was one of the original Three Stooges, mm -hmm. even though people think of him as a replacement Stooge because the original Three Stooges were Mo, Larry, and Shemp. And then Shemp went off on his own, and La and Curly was brought in. And, and those tend to be the classic Curly being the fat, funny guy, and Mo being the boss that abuses the others, and Larry being the stooge with the frizzy hair, mm -hmm. who also played the violin. Then in the 40s, Curly had a stroke, and so Shemp was brought in to be the third stooge. Brought back in. Yeah, brought back in mm -hmm. uh, for for the short films they were making at Columbia. And they cranked out a lot of them. That's another reason why, to me, unfortunately, the Three Stooges tend to be better known than the Marx Brothers is because there's so much more material. Yeah, that's right. As opposed to 13 movies and you know some rare tv appearances and groucho's quiz show in the 50s but you can't and the same thing with laurel and hardy who i love but they made silent films they made sound shorts they made sound features so there's a whole lot of stuff that they made from the late 20s to the early 50s mm -hmm. consistently and, um, just, and you know i think what happens is a lot of i mean i can tell you this I'm much more familiar with the Three Stooges, and the reason is I was a kid yep. in the 70s and 80s, right. and when you got sick and you stayed home, there right. were only six stations, right? Three three mm. VHS, or VHF, three And the UHF. educational stand, yeah. And you could see, or on weekends, you could see a lot of Three Stooges right. in syndication, well, television was a huge boost mm -hmm. to the Three Stooges' popularity. I mean, they had only just stopped making shorts when they started syndicating the stuff on television, and that led to a whole new... Because, you know, those weren't made for children. Those were, you know, short films were part of going to see a movie, and you would see the feature, and then they would have a newsreel because there wasn't television, and it would show you... Something, things that happened in the news, you know, within the past week or so, politically, sports, fashion, entertainment, and there might be a cartoon and uh, maybe a Three Stooges short, but it was not just a kiddie thing, but the kids really embraced them in the 50s and early 60s. And in fact, the Three Stooges were the first celebrities I ever saw in person because I was a kid in St. Louis. Mm -hmm. we, we lived there till I was seven. And the Three Stooges were promoting one of their uh, either – it wasn't Have Rocket, Will Travel, but it was one of those late 50s, early 60s things with Curly Joe taking over for Curly, the original Curly. 
and they were appearing somewhere and and I got to see them, which was really exciting. But I couldn't understand why they looked so much older in person than they did on my television set. Because, of course, I'm watching films from the early 30s and looking at them and saying, well, the curly doesn't look right. He doesn't look the same. Yes. And then Larry had what he had left of his hair slicked back. And I remember Mo saying, and this is Larry. He combs his hair with an egg beater. And I thought, even at seven, I thought, that joke doesn't work. Because uh-huh. combing your hair with an egg beater only works with the frizzy hair yes, Larry. Right. Now, anyway, that, that, this is the kind of child I was. So so um, mm. let me ask you two more questions. Yep. And then... Um, I will free you. The this is maybe sound like a strange question, but I'll give a strange answer. Was Groucho a good businessman? <sighs> I'm not sure. I he lost his first fortune in the stock market crash of '29. Mm-hmm. But didn't uh, everybody? I was going to say that is not unique to him. Yeah. He took the advice of Eddie Cantor and invested in G- Goldman Sachs. And the day that the stock market crash they were still doing animal crackers on broadway and you know groucho was really thrown by that he said his his uh his manager his his business guy his broker stockbroker called him up and said marks the jig is up that was how he phrased it to him and that night when he came out there was a, a moment in the in the show where groucho just turned to the audience and said don't ever get financial advice from eddie Cantor." I mean, he, it meant nothing to anyone there, but he just had to get that out. I see. So he spent the rest of his life more frugally. Okay. Um, I think because once you, I mean, to think about the hard scrabble years of vaudeville and, you know, sleeping in bunk beds oh, yeah, and, traveling and all train that stuff and, and horrible stuff and being mistreated and people throwing stuff at the stage and all that and making it in, to Broadway and being big Broadway stars and about to make your first movie. And they, you know, they eat, they had, you know, they had moved from their, you know, apartment kind of living to having big expensive houses in Great Neck, Long Island, where, uh, where all the famous literati had their estates yes. there and bought big cars. And they, and it was like, we've made it. And then Bang! Yes. It's all gone, and that must have been terrifying. Yes. So once Groucho came to California, he was more frugal, and you know, I think he 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 stayed with the same investment broker for decades. Sa- a guy named Salwin Shufro, very strange name, but he pops up in the Groucho letters, the book of letters to and from Groucho. So they were friends in addition to just being client. And then when Aaron Fleming came in, she started uh, causing Groucho to spend his money more freely, redecorating the house and buying more luxurious things that he really didn't give a shit about, I see. but wanted to please her. Hmm. So, you know, but I think Chico was considered, <clears throat> well, this is an interesting, then on the other hand, situation. Chico was the sh- more shrewd businessman and was great with numbers, just like an idiot savant with numbers in his head. But he was a compulsive gambler. Mm. And so, I mean, he would he would throw away good cards in a card game to make it more exciting. I see. Or he would bet $100 which of two raindrops would reach the bottom of a taxi window first. I see. So even though he was great, with money, he was horrible with money. I see, yeah. And was always broke. I mean, the, the whole cliche, and it always pops up on Gilbert Gottfried's podcast, Chico needed the money. It was true. Chico always needed the money. Uh. And they were, and his brothers were always bailing him out. But he probably had the best business sense if only he had used it for good instead of evil. I see, or for fun at the very least. Yeah. So last question. Um, tell me one thing Uh-oh. you're reading, watching, or listening to that's great, that's really, really good. Not just run-of-the-mill good, but you think it's outstanding. Are you saying your own c- something consumption. now? But yeah, something, something that you've been reading, that you watch, you listen to, that you're really enjoying. A thunderous silence. That doesn't mean that there isn't anything. I'm just trying. You sort of sideswipe me with that. Wow. I'm trying to think of the last movie that had me going so I couldn't catch my breath. Certainly Borat. Okay. 
it isn't that often. A lot of people think I'm not enjoying something because I'm not laughing. But the truth is, I, I'll get it and I'll appreciate it and I'll enjoy it. But it takes an extra thing. Sometimes I'll smile loudly. Mm-hmm. That's but uh, I and I know there have been other. I know I'm shortchanging. That's fine. Someone. I just needed one. So Boris oh, right. is a good answer. That's reasonably was that uh, for this millennium at least? Hey, look, it's it, it doesn't. You know, I mean, when I talked to and, Mike and Reese, he, and when I did Gilbert Gottfried's podcast okay. the first time, I was in purple faced. Sweat dripping, hysterics. I see. We played very well off each other with no, we didn't know we'd get along well. He just thought I was on to talk about my book. And then we sort of t- took off the gloves and got in the mud pit of being, you know, nine years old and it just had a blast. And, uh, I told my sister I want her to play that at my funeral. That's fantastic. And, um, I think that's probably the best place then with that idea my funeral? of your, um, of playing that podcast at your funeral rather yeah. than this one. <laughs> that, that said, um, this has been a great pleasure and super interesting as I, I hope expected. so. I really appreciate your time. It was my pleasure. Cheers. Thank you for listening. Don't forget to visit petermcgraw.org for more information about our guest, show notes, and social media links. If you've enjoyed this episode, please subscribe and share with others. Join Dr. Peter McGraw next week for another fun, fascinating conversation on I'm Not Joking. Yeah.